Hello, and thank you very much for joining. I am Alvaro Iladier, software engineer at Sysdic. In this session, we are going to talk about how to prevent security issues and optimize containerized applications by applying a quick set of best practices in your image fields. I hope you enjoy it. For the agenda, I'll try to answer the why question. What are the reasons behind these practices and how this is related to shifting left security? Then we'll move into the big topic blocks, unnecessary privileges, reduce attack surface, credentials and confidentiality, LinkedIn and scanning, and finally, what's beyond image building. The Docker files and example applications are available in the repository you can see in the footer. But let's start asking ourselves why. Why do we need some best practices? And the answer is because we want to get from the point where our images just work but by, might be full of issues and bad practices to our destination, where our containers are shiny, clean, and optimized. Probably you are already at some point in the middle, but I'll try to start from the beginning as if we are all new to containers and Docker. And why focus on Docker file? Can't we just detect problems later? Because detecting issues and vulnerabilities later is more expensive and creates more overhead. So if we know the risks, let's take rid of them in advance. This is closely related to the shift left security paradigm, tackle security problems as soon as possible in a collaborative way between teams instead of ignoring them in the earliest stages and rely on periodic auditor checks or similar. Docker files practices are applied in the earliest stages. And they won't solve every single issue, but it will help you avoid common errors and pitfalls. What do we mean by early stages? The container lifecycle comprises multiple stages. Since the Docker file is created, built, and tested in a local developer machine through the CI CD pipeline automations, being distributed to a registry, and finally being deployed and executed somewhere. We will focus mainly in the image building process that happens locally in the developer machine. So let's jump to the first block unnecessary privileges. According to SysDig 2021 Container Security and Usage Report, 58% of containers are running as root UID 0. So it's very common that containers are executed with more privileges than required. The risks of running as root or simply with higher privileges are that an attacker can exploit vulnerabilities or bugs and use those excessive privileges to gain access to other services or resources. In our blog post, Cloud Lateral Movement, we analyze how a public-facing web application running in AWS can be exploited to access AWS instance metadata in the container and use those credentials with Amicus configuration to assume a different role and get full control over EC2 instances, like creating new instances. Furthermore, OpenShift and other container runtimes uh, might impose restrictions and don't allow running containers as root by default. Let's see an example. In step one, we start with a very simple Docker file using Alpine, copy a precompiled binary for application and set the entry point of the image to that application. We can build the image and run it exposing port 5000. This application is a very simple hello world application that just receives a request, logs the request and greets the user. We test the application, sending some requests with uh, Carl, and the response is the hi webinar or hi Alvaro greeting. Checking inside the container by executing a shell in the, con in the running container, we can see that the access log file is owned by root and the process is also running as root. As this is not a good practice, let's fix it. We switch the user by using the user instruction to use UID 1000 instead. When we try to run the container, now we get an error. The application now cannot open the access log file. Why? slash app folder is owned by root, but we run as user ID 1000, so we cannot write to the slash app folder. Let's fix the permissions by executing a chom right here to set the correct owner for, for the folder. Another application starts correctly. Now, we check again inside the container and now the access log file is owned by UID 1000 and the process runs as UID 1000. Great. But 
there is still something we can improve. What if we want or need to run the container as a different UID? For example, we try to run the application as UID 1001 and it fails due to the owner of slash app being user 1000, not 1001, similar to the error we saw before. We can fix this by changing the work there to slash tmp. Due to the sticky bit permissions in slash tmp, this directory is special so anyone can write and becomes the owner of the created file. Now we can see the application is running and now we can verify the container is running with a different UID 1001. In general, it is a good idea to separate the application folder and the data folder. This way, it is easier to manage permissions and also you get persistent for, for free. You could mount the data folder as a host folder and make the access log persistent so it isn't removed every time the container stops. Please also note that the access log is owned by UID 1001, but the owner of the example app binary uh, the executable is root. We can check a couple of slides um, before, okay? This is, in fact, this having the binary owned um, by root is a good practice. We don't need the application to be owned by the user also. As long as the user has executing permission, uh, that's okay. And having the binaries owned by root while the app runs as an unprivileged user ensures the unmutability of the container. If the binaries were owned by the same user executing the application, any bug or exploit in the application could be used to modify the application itself or other helper binaries, and then an attacker could exploit that modified binaries to perform other actions. So run as a non-privileged user, but keep the files in the container owned by root so they are unmutable. In general, follow the principle of least privilege. Your service, uh, your service sorry, or application should have the minimal set of permissions <clears throat> to access the required resources and perform the required actions, nothing else. Avoid running containers as root unless it is strictly necessary. And as a good practice, allow running as any UID, not a fixed one, not a fixed UID. This is required by some default security constraints uh, like uh, OpenSea, for example, and it will also simplify permissions when you need to mount a host directory or share data between containers, etc. Now, moving on, the next set of good practices is targeted to reduce attack surface. The problem we are trying to solve here is that in cladding unnecessary packages or exposing a new ports, your system is being more exposed to attacks. Also, if you are using and deploying components that are not under your control, you could include exploitable vulnerabilities. Regarding how you build a, an application that will run inside your container, one thing that you should avoid is building the application externally, like in here, and then copy the resulting artifact into the container. Why not? You are disregarding one of the nicest features in containers, the reproducibility. You don't have control of the outside world, outside the container. So different developers can be using different versions of the compiler, different libraries, etc., resulting in a slightly different behavior. How can we get reproducible builds? Well, you can get reproducible builds by building inside an own container with a known tool chain. In this example, we install the Go tool chain inside an Alpine image we copy the source code to the container and build inside the container. But this is still a bad approach. We are including the compiler toolchain inside the container itself and also the source code of the application. Removing the source code and uninstalling the toolchain won't make things better. We will see that later. Also, I talked about reproducibility, but can you spot what's wrong with reproducibility in here? We aren't pinning any versions either Alpine, the Go compiler, etc. We'll talk about that later too. So, what's a better approach? Basically, you build in one builder container and then copy the artifacts to another container. You can use two different Docker files or you can use the multi-stage builds Docker feature where you can copy from a previous stage, a different container, to the current stage. In this example, we use the Golang container as the builder 
and then we create a different container and we just copy the executable from the previous stage. As we mentioned, this leads us to reproducible builds and also a minimal image size without build tools or undesired dependency packages. See the comparison in the slide, like for, well, this is a, a very exaggerated example, but we are going from 400 megabytes to just seven megabytes of the binary. Okay, here I showed a Golang example, but the same pattern can be applied to other languages. In this example, we compile some TypeScript files in a container and then just copy the resulting JavaScript files and install the dependencies in the final container. You can find multiple examples of different languages and frameworks over the internet. Also, to reduce the attack surface, try, um, try to avoid big generic distribution images if they are not needed. In this example, we are using Sysdig Line Scanner to analyze the Ubuntu uh, Docker image. I have removed most of the output from, from this example just to highlight some interesting findings in red, like non vulnerabilities found in DPKG, GCC5, or system uh, CSV packages, or for example, some files using set UID bit. That makes me wonder will you need the GCC5 compiler, the CSV compatibility scripts, or the DPKG package manager, or even bash in your final container? Indeed, there are about 100 vulnerabilities in this image, and most likely you don't need many of these packages. We will see alternatives soon. Even official images, for example, the official node or the official uh, Apache, uh, etc., official WordPress, to tell some examples, might not be uh, the best fit for you. Even if they are from an official, verified, and trusted source, they might be focused on in providing a nice experience for testing that specific application and cover more generic use cases by including additional libraries, additional tools, or helpers. The following one is obvious, but please don't use outdated images. New vulnerabilities are discovered continuously, so there is a high probability that outdated images can be exploited. Also, don't go mad about using the latest bleeding edge versions, as there can be breaking changes, but However, try to stick to well-supported versions with frequent updates and security patches. Now, another common case. You found this guy, John Doe Hacker, published an image in Docker Hub, which fits your application requirements very nicely. Why shouldn't I just use this as uh, my base image? There is a plethora of reasons. Uh, you are inheriting all the problems and vulnerabilities from that image. You don't know who builds and publishes that image. You also might wonder, is it updated regularly? How is it built? Are we sure that the published version is really the one built from the uh, public Docker file you found over there? Okay, so I talked about the don'ts, but then what should, I, what should I do? Basically, prefer verified, official, trusted images with frequent releases and updates over untrusted and unknown sources. Check if there are optimized versions better suited for production than generic or official versions. As a quick example, Bitnami provides images for several environments like Node in this example, which are customized versions built on top of a small mini dev distribution, frequently updated, signed, and verified with a security scan. In general, try to be minimal. Distributions like Alpine Linux are a common choice and many official images provide Alpine-based versions. Ideally, you could build your container from scratch, an empty image, but this is usually not possible due to binaries uh, depending on some basic system libraries or configuration files. The DistroLess project from Google Container Tools is another common choice. They provide some very slim, stripped-down images where everything but the essential libraries are removed. The base Debian team image will only include libc, libssl, and openssl, and even the slimmer static Debian 10 can be used for statically compiled applications like Go that don't require libc. So, be minimal. Could you use a carrier ship to cross a small river? You can use a small boat for that purpose and save a lot of trouble. And in case you find a custom image, a custom but untrusted image that works for you, take the Docker file as an example 
and build your own base images instead of relying on untrusted published images. In any case, please, this is very important, define a versioning strategy. Let's face it, you will have to update your images often. So try to stick to stable long-term support versions so you are sure that you will be receiving fixes for a while. Then rebuild periodically or whenever new fixes are applied to the base image. Also, don't forget about libraries. Tools like NPM or Go offer ways to specify version ranges in the dependencies so you can, for example, stick to a major version but receive minor updates and patches. Finally, please plan in advance and be ready to drop old versions when they reach the end of life. Migrate to newer versions and fix any breaking changes before you stop receiving updates. Now, let's talk a different topic about credentials and confidentiality or leaking data. The problem with leaking credentials or sensitive information in your containers is it might open a door for attackers to access your systems or simply expose confidential information and get you and your company in trouble. Let's see with an example of what shouldn't be done. Please don't include hard-coded credentials or add credential file or environment variables directly from your Docker file. In this example, we include a token as an environment variable and we copy an AWS credentials file into the container. So reading the value of the token in the environment is as easy as inspecting the image. You just run a Docker inspect and you can see the token in there. It is embedded in the container configuration. And getting the content of the credentials file requires just executing a command inside the container. You can see we run a cat for the file and we can get the credentials. Okay, you might say, by I can copy the credentials because I need them to execute something. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then remove them. It won't work. Let's see, in this case, it is a bit trickier because the file is not in there in the final image. So just running the cat command won't reveal the credentials, but we can use a tool like Scopio to copy the image compromised of several layers, binary blobs, and a config file to a destination folder. Then we can examine the image manifest, get the digest of the config file, and we examine that blob, the config file from the image folder. And the config file we contain will contain a list of the images of the image layers, and each layer is a tar file. So we can just extract the tar file from the layer before the image is deleted and get the credentials from there. So please don't forget the layered nature of images. Container images are composed of a set of layers where each command creates a new layer, which is great for distribution, sharing, and reusing. But at the same time, it means that removing a layer still takes space and the file is still accessible in the image, extracting the corresponding layer. Removing a file just means that it is marked as erased and not available in the final composition. So this brings up another couple of optimization tips. First, it is a good idea to combine multiple run commands into a single one to reduce the number of layers. And second, more stable layers or commands creating layers less likely to change should be placed first as they are easier to catch, speeding up the build process. Let's see an example. Here we're building an image and we run multiple commands. Many of these commands can be executed in a single run, as we see in the following slide, chaining them with the double ampersand operator. So one command failing will interrupt the other. Okay, can you see multiple run, single run? Basically, in this example, we are installing wget and node.js, and then we download and extract a, a file. And finally, we are uninstalling wget and the downloaded file. I'll go quite fast over the topic, but we can see that we save a couple of megabytes in this example in uh, the unified run command because the wget package and the downloaded file still exists in the intermediate layers when we use multiple run commands. However, when we use a single run, the resulting layer has no traces of them. If we compare the layers with, this, with the inspect command, 
and we see there is one layer per run command versus the optimized version where we only have one layer combining all the commands, one single run. But we are breaking another good practice in the previous example. What is less likely to change? Our application code will, will probably change often as we are developing it. So it makes sense to move it after the run command. Otherwise, any change in the application source code will invalidate the build catch and Docker will execute the run command again. Another typical leakage point is the build context. What's the build context? The dot at the um, docker build command specifies the build context folder. All the files in this folder are sent to the docker daemon. If you are not careful, you can send confidential files, source code, configuration files, uh, backups, log files, temporary files, etc. All copy and add commands operate on the build context. So, in this example, the copy command in the Docker file, this one, um, would, um, would copy everything inside your current folder to the slash my app folder, including the Docker file itself, which is in the current directory from the app flag in the Docker build. Good practices include using a clean build context, for example, using a clean folder instead of the current folder which contains the other required files for the image building process. Also, uh, remember to include a docker ignore file to specify which files or folders should be omitted. And in general, try to be explicit by using copy over add and avoid wildcards. Copy is more explicit and predictable and add can do other things like copy files from an URL or an extra data file. But if you don't need that, please use copy instead. And now, a quick discussion about LinkedIn scanning. Fortunately, there are tools, uh, to name one example, the Haskell Dockerfile linter, that can detect errors and bad practices in Dockerfile and tell you about them in advance. Handling can even expose issues in the shell commands executed by run instructions. Others like Cystic Image Scanner, uh, apart from detecting vulnerabilities, can also detect bad practices. In this example, we can see a set of rules applied to Dockerfile, like detecting a Dockerfile with effective user root or an exposed port 22, the SSH server port. As usual, automation is better than manual, so consider incorporating such a tool in your CI-CD pipeline. Okay, regarding uh, image scanning, in order to detect both non-vulnerabilities and bad practices, the earlier the scan is performed, the better. Scanning images can be performed at different stages of the container image lifecycle. Then, where should the image be scanned? Well, it depends. Again, earlier is better, but it is not always possible. For example, a developer can scan the image locally before pushing to the Docker uh, before pushing um, the Docker file to a repository, a code, a GitHub, or whatever repository. But a developer can push some changes in the repository and bypass the scanning, either intentionally or just uh, forget. So scanning in the CI/CD pipeline right after building the image and before pushing to the Docker registry will prevent pushing and scanned or vulnerable images into the Docker registry. And then why trigger the scanning when pushing a new image to the registry? Well, you cannot guarantee that every image uploaded to the registry has gone through the CACD pipeline. Somebody might just push the image. Then you can scan an image right before deploying and running it via a Kubernetes admission controller. This way, you can prevent deployment of vulnerable images from other registries, like, for example, public registries. Uh, but a mission controller is not always available, and it can be quite disruptive. So sometimes it is just enough to make sure that all running images are scanned and get a report of non-vulnerabilities in order to take corrective actions. Well, but good practices and security extend way beyond the image uh, building itself. For example, remember uh, we talked about unnecessary privileges? In fact, the orchestrator, the like Kubernetes, OpenShift, etc., and the runtime have the last word about the effective user running the container. It doesn't matter the user you specify in your Docker file, it will just be the default, but it can be overridden at runtime. So, as your images should be ready to run as any user, please avoid running them as root. OpenShift and some other Kubernetes cluster will apply security policies that prevent root or privileged containers by default. 
You can usually override that behavior by defining less restrictive policies, but there are therefore a reason, so don't do it unless necessary. Furthermore, you can restrict other capabilities like certain privileges or system calls with a runtime configuration. By doing so, you limit the range of action of an attacker in case a container is compromised. For more information, check the cap drop flag in Docker, the security context capabilities drop settings in Kubernetes. Also, you can apply a Paramour and Sepcom profiles in both Docker and Kubernetes. And after deployment, you cannot just leave your container running in the wild and forget about it. New vulnerabilities are discovered daily. That means there is a time frame since the vulnerability is discovered until you deploy a new image with a fix while your image is vulnerable and can be exploited. So remember, update images often and have a versioning strategy to keep this time frame as small as possible. But detecting issues for runtime images is also quite important. Cystic image vision can alert you when newly discovered vulnerabilities apply for already analyzed images so you can take preventive actions and plan the update as soon as possible. Also, Falco and Sysdig, uh, Falco is the open source cloud native runtime security tool, can detect threats or running on running containers by detecting suspicious activities like network connections, certain files being accessed, spawn processes, etc. Also, tools like Sysdig can even respond to these threats by stopping the container or pausing it for further forensic analysis. And it might sound like a low budget V movie, but uh, mutant tags are a real issue. The image pointed by latest tag today might be a totally different image tomorrow as the tags can mutate. You can read more about this in our blog post, Attack of the Mutant Tags, or Why Tag Mutability is a Real Security Threat, also available as a talk in virtual reads. But threats are present even before you build your first image. The Docker socket itself is a big privileged door into the system where the Docker daemon is running. Basically, having access to the Docker socket, you can execute privileged commands in the host system. So make sure the permissions for bar room docker sock are correctly set and if the socket is being exposed via TCP, protect it. About distribution, container images can be digitally signed using Docker Content Trust, Docker Notary, Harbor Notary, or similar tools. Using them, you can instruct your runtime system to only allow trusted images. And finally, even the finest piece of software can fail. Docker and Kubernetes offer different health checks or liveness proofs to verify that the application or service is alive and working correctly. Use them, especially for critical, long-running processes or persistent services, so they are automatically restarted in case of malfunction. And so that was all for today. I must uh, say thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed your session and found it useful. And now I will stay on for a few more minutes to answer your questions in the Q&A. Have a great day and thank you again.